Last time on this fucking thing. I am only capable of watching so much anime before I vanish into the ether, never to be seen or heard from again. No, I'm not ready to go. No, I'm not ready to go. I don't have a lot of time. After the last episode of this series, I was consumed by the abyss of people who dare to skip anime OPs, and their emissaries brainwashed me into becoming... one of them. I hate to admit it, but they actually made me want to skip the latest Attack on Titan OP. It has been over a year since I have seen the light of day, but thankfully my adoration for the Clan Ad After Story OP kept me from becoming the subject of a mind break hentai, but that also means that while I have been trying to keep up with seasonal anime, I, I've had absolutely no outlet to speak on them. I can still feel them, skulking through the darkness, insisting that I skip the seventh My Hero OP, despite my insistence that it's a good one, damn it! I, uh, I digress. Without further distraction, let's see what aired this season, starting with those I dropped like a sack of years old potatoes. Seasons past, one fact that I have tried my best to accept is that there is way too much anime and not enough time to watch it all. While it would be nice to abide by the infamous three episode rule with each series on the list, sometimes that can be rendered impossible by the sheer amount of anime that we have to get through. Doll's Frontline is the latest from Izetta the Last Witch and Peach Boy Riverside Studio Asahi Production, and while the director Shigeru Ueda has also lent his talents to titles such as Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, and despite the art and animation styles being profoundly inspired, there wasn't much else to convince me it'd be worth watching for the long haul. I often find myself wishing the industry would shift away from the typical isekai in favor of more straight fantasy stories, but in the case of the Genius Prince's Guide to Raising a Nation Out of Debt, this is most certainly not what I mean. It felt like something crucial was missing from the formula. It had characters, sure, and things were happening to said characters, that much is indisputable, but I found myself incapable of caring about any of it. It felt as if the pacing on this first episode was way faster than it had any right to be. Had I read the light novels it's based on, perhaps I would have found the characters likable or the jokes the least bit funny, but since I lacked context, everything landed flat on its face. I had a feeling, as I started the premiere episode of Rusted Armors, that I would be dropping it, and less than nine minutes in, that prophecy became reality. I can't say that I mind the shoddy CG animation so much. While it's not phenomenal, it's not really any worse than the early seasons of Ruby. It's more that Rusted Armors feels less like a coherent narrative and more like a bunch of loosely related scenes stitched together into an unholy abomination that was also somehow really, really, really boring. Is there a chance that this series will eventually become something worth watching? I mean, sure, but I am willing to miss out on that life-changing narrative if it means I can avoid another supernatural tale set in feudal Japan. If you're into that setting, check out Rusted Armors, but I am most certainly not. It takes an exceptional premise to justify a double-length series premiere. It worked with the Rising of the Shield Hero, but that was also a legitimately good anime. Tokyo 24th Ward, on the other hand, is not. 
It's one of the latest offerings from Cloverworks, the hit or miss studio behind such works as Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai and The Promised Neverland, and unlike another series by Cloverworks that we'll talk about a little later on, I kept nodding off during Tokyo 24th Ward's first episode. It was so boring, and while I initially told myself I would give it another episode or two, I would much rather drink a bleach cocktail than watch more of this bland, milk toast sci fi adventure. If you've seen the last episode of this series, you might know what's next. But for the uninitiated, to cut down on the overall length of this video, I want to summarize my thoughts on the anime I couldn't bring myself to drop nor complete in a series of haikus. I am not a professional poet, nor do I claim to be. Ready? Go! Rust Eater Bisco. It seemed very generic. I should probably drop Fantasia Songo. I don't have an opinion. It was kinda cool. Leadale was chill. I am tired of isekais. Can we please, please stop? Q. Looked pretty cute. Of all the ones on this list, this, I'll probably watch. Miss Kuroitsu was a neat departure from standard toku shows. Rose King's plot was so quickly paced, I felt like I went to the speed of light. up to Demon Slayer's muchly anticipated second season, the objectively awful decision to pad its two core run with a filler episode followed by six episodes that retold the story from the movie that anyone who cared about had already seen since it was made available for streaming via Crunchyroll and Funimation made keeping up with this season a low priority for me. And when I say the Mugen Train arc retold the story from the movie, of course I mean they just chopped the already existing movie into six parts and re released them in an episodic format, which was a disappointment to those of us who wanted a full season of new content. That said, was it worth the reduced runtime? <laughs> be no surprise to anyone who watched the first season and Mugen Train that Demon Slayer's Entertainment District arc hits the ground running after the aforementioned abysmal decision and sets the stage for some particularly exciting moments as we look forward to the confirmed third season, reigniting the flames of hope that Ufotable plans on adapting this whole series. Don't get me wrong. As much as I enjoy seeing this story unfold in real time, the recognition that Demon Slayer wouldn't be nearly as popular or well received if a different studio was in charge isn't lost on me. I can't bring myself to read the manga because I can't imagine this series without its beautiful and dazzling animation, so I am pleading with you, Fotable. Take a break from evading taxes, at least until you finish Demon Slayer. If you then decide to continue with the tax evasion, you'll have earned it as a treat. In all seriousness though, if they can keep the winds coming with the Swordsmith Village arc and not pull any absurd shenanigans like dropping a film adaptation and chopping it up into episodes, then it's bound to be fantastic. I am not one to typically enjoy BL. I have nothing against the genre, it's fine for those who are into it, but I am not usually into it. I say usually here because Sasuke and Miyano is handled so well that it seems to transcend genre and becomes more than just your typical boys love anime. Animated by Studio Dean, the minds behind the original Higurashi no Nakokoro ni and Fate Stay Night adaptations, Sasuke and Miyano is somehow able to channel romantic 
dramedy greats such as Horror Mia and Bloom Into You to deliver a truly enjoyable story about two adorkable goofballs who are simply learning to exist as they are. It follows, you guessed it, Miyano, an introverted bookworm known for reading BL manga and Sasaki, his senpai who develops a crush on him after a fateful encounter. Miyano and Sasaki become fast friends once the latter expresses interest and acceptance of the former's hobby, but within a few episodes, both are forced to question if there's something more between them. I like how this series seems to take place in a world where the concept of same-sex relations is normalized to the point where, while both Miyano and Sasaki admit that they're into women, neither are made to feel like the other for also being into each other. Not by themselves, and not by anyone else in their lives. It's just normal. I also really like how remarkable the dub is. In fact, that's the version I have watched more than anything else. It's directed by Emily Fajardo and stars Kellen Goff and Joshua Waters in the titular roles, which results in the talent and skill of everyone involved being displayed in full force. There have been a number of instances where conversations had sounded like real conversations you might hear in real life as if they were recorded in real time between Goff and Waters. I think that just demonstrates the skill of not only the leading actors, but the director as well. I highly recommend Sasaki and Miyano in either language format to anyone who's looking for an anime they might not normally watch. I think you'll be delightfully surprised. What a lovely day. I am not currently experiencing any sources of broad anxiety. <laughs> I am very tired of Attack on Titan. I was once a massive fan of the series. It was one of the most exciting anime of last year. Until I decided to read ahead in the manga and... I'll reiterate, I am very tired of Attack on Titan. It's a fantastic story that's worth reading or watching, but... Between MAPPA gaslighting us into thinking the final season was actually the final season, and the fanbase pushing the lie that it's one of the greatest works of fiction to exist ever, I am ready for the series to actually end. It could be that I was just so underwhelmed by the trajectory the manga took that while I still watched the anime, I, it felt like I was just watching out of obligation. It was cool seeing certain endgame moments animated, though. Seeing the rumbling come to life was a visual treat in and of itself, but because the last handful of chapters were so disappointing, I can't bring myself to be excited anymore. In fact, it makes me nostalgic for the time when the mystery was still a mystery, when the colossal titan was still the biggest threat, and when I still had hope that Attack on Titan would be one of the greatest works of fiction. It's not, though. It's, at best, that meme of the drawing of a horse that gets worse and worse the further right it gets. I don't really care if I'm alone in that opinion, and it's not like I hate the series either. I just... I am just really, really, really tired of Attack on Titan. Oh my god! Fuck! I love Marion Kitagawa. So much, I can't hide it! Remember when I said that Cloverworks is a hit or miss studio? I think that becomes even more annoying when their hits are so massive. Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai and Horimiya were both brilliant inclusions to their respective seasons, but neither can compare to the vivid excellence of My Dress Up Darling and one of its protagonists, the objective best girl, Marin Kitagawa. My Dress Up Darling follows Wakana Gojo, an introvert who obsesses over making Hina dolls. He isn't the kind of person to readily make friends until an encounter with his school's most popular girl, Kitagawa, at which point he gets roped into using his crafting skills to make her cosplays, and from there, a blooming friendship, and maybe something more, begins to take shape. I don't have much to say about this one aside from this. The genuine way it tackles creativity and passion makes me strive to be better in my own creative endeavors. Seeing the way Kitagawa cares for the characters she loves should inspire each and every one of us to cherish something as much as she does. I appreciate how accurately it portrays the inner workings of Gojo's mind, especially when it comes to his confusion about just why Maureen is spending so much time with him. It's a unique 
kind of overthinking that I am very familiar with. I had a feeling as I started the first episode and saw that OP that this would be a massive hit, and I was right. I am gonna hold out hope that we'll get a second season as soon as possible, but to be honest, it's more likely that Cloverworks will instead choose to adapt Reborn as a vending machine, now I wander the dungeon, or something inane like that. Is it clear yet that I don't have much hope for them? I fucking love you, man. I love you, dog. I love you. I fucking love you, man. Get out of here. Be in this moment. Live in this shit with me. I love you. I love you, too. I love you. I fucking love you. I love you! I think that as soon as I heard the full title of this one, part of me was already in for the ride. I may be utterly exhausted with the standard isekai, but this... This is anything but. Life with an ordinary guy who reincarnated into a total fantasy knockout is one of the funniest, if not the funniest, anime this season, and it accomplishes that without punching down, which is impressive given its subject matter. Life with an ordinary guy who reincarnated into a total fantasy knockout follows Tachibana and Jinguji, a pair of office workers in their 30s who've been friends since childhood. Jinguji is a ladies' man who has no real interest in women, while Tachibana is a first ever virgin with no game whatsoever. If he were playing Elden Ring, you could say he has absolutely no maidens. So, one night after a mixer, they're taken to another world by a mysterious goddess where Tachibana finds he has been transformed into a beautiful blonde-haired woman, and to make matters worse, the friends notice their mutual attraction for each other and do everything in their power to suppress it lest their friendship be ruined. It's basically bros being bros, but then one bro isn't a bro anymore, and it's bro-nominal bro. I don't know if it's the ideal analog for the trans experience, as Tachibana identifies as a man, but Jinguji refers to her with feminine pronouns, and she doesn't seem to mind. And as far as I can tell as a filthy cishet, the fact that Tachibana was once a man is rarely, if ever, the butt of the joke. I could be wrong, but this seems to be one of the most progressive anime out there, which is saying a lot. In any case, who could have guessed that the runner-up for best girl would be a hentai protagonist? Not me. That's a nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. I could be the only person who thinks this, but Platinum End has actually been pretty good. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I have seen a constant barrage of complaints about how the main character makes this one irredeemable, and to those I only say... He's no worse than Eren. In Platinum End, we follow Mirai Kakehashi, who is chosen by the angel Nase as a candidate to succeed God. But there are 12 other candidates who are vying for the highest throne of them all, and several of them want nothing more than to reshape their world into a devastating nightmare. It echoes a lot of the same ideas as Mirai Nikki, with the survival game between 13 weirdos with the winner ultimately becoming God, but what Platinum End does differently is is that it prioritizes discussion and diplomacy above mindless slaughter. I mean, the premise seems to imply that if all 13 candidates meet for a summit and agree on who will become the new god, then that's it. But it's an anime, so of course there are some candidates who are intentionally obtuse or just want to kill other people. And a lot of viewers hate Mirai because he's not one of those characters. I get that he can be a little insufferable, but again, he's not nearly as obtuse or self-sabotaging as Eren, and the same people will fawn over him like he's the second coming of Lelouch Lamprouge. Mirai is... Fine. He's practically harmless. I remember thinking to myself during the first core that they just don't make anime like this anymore. And by that I mean it seems rare for an anime to be produced after the manga has finished, and even rarer for it to be short enough that the anime will end conclusively without the need for any further seasons. Unfortunately, now that I have finished Platinum End, I can say that I feel ashamed for having defended it for as long as I have. I won't go into spoilers, but if you were looking for me to decide if you should give this one a watch or not, 
save yourself the time and nihilism by watching Mirai Nikki. I think Platinum End offered a lot of interesting, if pretentious, ideas, but in the end, they failed to deliver on any one of them, and I very much regret the time I spent watching it. I've only had OJ for a day and a half, but if anything happened to him, I would kill everyone in this room and then myself. Very violent eulogy, I like it. I have already made a video on Ranking of Kings, so I will do my best to avoid repeating myself. I adore this series. It's such a well-made, brilliantly written sleeper hit that I almost didn't watch, but I am very glad that I did. It may have played out a bit differently than I thought, but that's perfectly alright because the level of quality and care infused into the very essence of Ranking of Kings is impossible to ignore. Ranking of Kings follows the crown prince of the kingdom of Boss, Boji, born without the ability to hear or speak but who holds within himself a power that surpasses all others, strength of will. When King Boss is met with an untimely demise, and his birthright is stripped and given to his younger brother Dida, Boji embarks on the adventure of a lifetime with his newfound shadow friend Kage, and will find that he's always had the strength needed to become king, he just needed to awaken it. I was not prepared for the second core to be what it was. Not to be negative, I, but I was wholly convinced that they'd drag their feet and make us wait until season 2 or 3 before answering any of the questions raised in the first half, but no, the second half pretty much answers everything. I have no idea what, if anything, happens in the manga after this, but I am hoping we get a second season. As I prepare to say goodbye to Boji and Dida and Hilling this season, I am left with two thoughts. Studio Wit has another winner on their hands with Ranking of Kings, and they really dodged the bullet with Mappa taking over Attack on Titan. I was unsure what to think as I started Love of Kill. It was a slow burn, and one of the mains is a certifiable incel stalker, but there was always something about it that kept me coming back for more. It's a masterfully woven tapestry of mystery and suspense that kept me on the edge of my seat as I binged episode after episode until I caught up, at which point I was left with a mighty need for more. Love of Kill follows Chateau Dankworth, whose name sounds like it'd be included in the credits of an SNES game made in Japan, alongside such classics as Sleeve McDykel, Glen Allen Mixon, and Anatoly Smorin. Chateau is a bounty hunter who encounters the enigmatic assassin Song Ryangha while on a mission, and while the two should be mortal enemies, Ryangha takes a liking to her and starts following her around, much to her disgust. It soon becomes clear, however, that something unexplainable ties them together, something that could involve the long-forgotten past Chateau can't seem to remember. I think Love of Kill might be one of the most surprising entries on this list. In a different world, I might have dropped it after the third episode because Ryangha was an insufferable stalker, but the more I watched, the more I realized both Chateau and Ryangha are multifaceted characters whose actions are directly inspired by the ongoing mystery presented in the series at large. Or it could just be that Jim is the most relatable character in the history of anime as a medium, and I respect the fact that he clearly lacks a mouth, yet sounds like he's ripped straight from the cast of Senpai Club. No, no, wait, it's not what you think. This is a big misunderstanding, you've got to believe me, I... Listen, I am telling you, you better listen to me! Mom. You like sailor uniforms. Don't use a cabbie. Yes! Yes! I admit it! Mom. I love sailor uniforms. In what is the last of the Cloverworks trio this season, we have Akabi's Sailor Uniform, a series that, at times, feels like a wholesome slice of life series about an all girls school and at others, like it's gaslighting you into thinking it's a wholesome slice of life series about an all-girls school. I noticed right away that aside from the character designs making everyone look like they're Spongebob asking Squidward if he likes Krabby Patties, there are certain cuts that give me the impression that someone on staff has a sailor uniform kink. 
Akabi's sailor uniform follows Komichi Akabi, a first-year junior high student who, as a kid, fell in love with Robi Private Academy's sailor uniform and decided she wanted to attend if it meant she could wear it. It turns out, however, that while Akabi has made it past her exams and is now a Robi student, they no longer require a sailor uniform. But wearing a sailor uniform is her dream, and she won't let anyone get in the way of that dream, even if it means she's the only student wearing one. I know I gave this one a hard time for having a unique character design and animation style, but it only makes sense for a series about someone breaking the mold and showing off their personality to have a unique personality itself. I think my favorite thing about Akabi's sailor uniform is that you go into it half expecting Akabi to be bullied for being different, but at least through the fifth episode, everyone seems to be incredibly kind and welcoming of Akabi's eccentricities, something that I think we need more of in anime. It's a comfy series that I very much look forward to seeing more of, and... Wait. You know what that means. The ratio. The ratio has been broken in my confinement at the heathen's temple. Uh, th they performed a, a, a ritual of sorts. I wasn't told what the ritual's goal was, but I have a feeling. They implied that if any given season Cloverworks had at least two good anime, the seals would be broken and he would be freed from his prison. I think the ritual was to assist in his reincarnation, and I unwittingly paid a role. 